Thank you for coming to the Desert Blockchain Lightning Talks and special guest session tonight. This is our monthly um, session, which happens on the last Wednesday of every month at 7 p.m. and it's uh, happening here at Grand Canyon University. And really want to thank Grand Canyon for hosting us at this great facility. Um, it really, really works out well. So. My name is Jay Carpenter. I'm the founder of Desert Blockchain, and the, <laughs> uh, the primary goal of Desert Blockchain is to build community here in Phoenix and in Arizona of people that are interested in this new realm of innovation. And you showing up here tonight is a big, big piece of that community building. So I really, really want to thank you for being here tonight and. I'm excited to introduce you to some of the startups that are happening here locally, as well as uh, introduce you to our special guest who's going to be talking about a very, very exciting project. So um, are there any questions um, before we get started? What is blockchain? What is blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is funny because about, about two years ago, I told one of my relatives, I said, you know, I'm, I'm really into this blockchain thing, and, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's, it's the basis of cryptocurrency and blah, blah, blah. And so now, every time I see him, he goes, how's that chain link thing? <laughs> so, so yet, once again, I'm into a realm that my parents would never understand. So um, anyway. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how the night's going to go. Um, so you're welcome to help yourself to more food and drink and whatever that's out there. Uh, the bathrooms are down the hall. Um, we're going to have five lightning talks, which are going to be about six or rather seven to ten minutes. Um, and then we're going to talk about a real, really, really exciting opportunity here in Arizona. Um, and hopefully get your feedback on how that opportunity might become reality. So um, I'm going to leave that for a little bit later. But um, who's here for the first time? Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I would like to say that any mention of financial products or anything that has to do with outlay of funds is the sole responsibility of whoever is uh, talking about that. So uh, Desert Blockchain does not endorse any particular projects or uh, opportunities or anything like that. Um, after, so we're going to have the, the we're going to go till about 8.30 and then we're going to break and then after that, I invite you to go over to Canyon 49 next door for more networking until about 10 p.m., uh, which is when they close or they throw us out. So, um, uh, these, these sessions are designed so that uh, there's plenty of opportunity to get to know one another in the community. And please share whatever your interest is. If you have questions, um, this is a great group to get questions answered or maybe you know explore certain questions areas that you're interested in together and say hey let's you know let's exchange emails and let's figure out uh, this particular area because this is very very broad in terms of the scope the weeds on this stuff so um, all right, so unless there are questions, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. I would appreciate it if somebody could dial in to or go to the website and make sure that the live stream is coming through and that the sound, if you could put your headphones in and make sure that the sound is coming through, I'd appreciate that. First Lightning Talk is a startup uh, here in Phoenix, 
and it's called uh, Sky Republic. And we have uh, Chris, who's the CEO of Sky Republic. Um, Chris is going to tell us about Sky Republic, and you'll have a chance to ask him some questions about uh, what the project is and how that's going. So please welcome Chris. And I'm sorry, I can't remember your last name. Fabry. Fabry. Chris Fabry. Yeah, so the topic of uh, my presentation is going to be enterprise blockchain, uh, which is something pretty new, a little bit more recent than the cryptocurrency world. So effectively, I'm the founder and CEO of Sky Republic, which is a, an enterprise blockchain uh, vendor based in, in Scottsdale. Principles have been uh, used first in cryptocurrencies, right? You all know that. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others. But very quickly, enterprises were very interested into the tech, into the core of the tech, to see if they could do more with their transactions. And uh, uh, they looked at the code and uh, governments, central banks, and I could provide you links to the reports, and very quickly they find showstoppers on the current infrastructure. So, problem of liability, privacy, performance, scalability. And so that created a wave of new initiatives that you may know, uh, could you raise your hand if you heard about Hyperledger, which by IBM? Yeah, no. everybody knows Corda, Corom, Coco, right? So Scala Public is exactly in the in the vein of that. So what you see here is the previous version. We're launching our new platform uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to, to talk about that right now. So what do we what is the purpose of our new platform? Is to create effectively trusted digital ecosystem, but we have a focus which is really uh, important is to focus on mission critical transactions for a corporate or government. So, what kind of transaction I'm talking about? I'm talking about uh, instruments trading for banks, loans. I'm talking about purchase order, bill of lading for a supply chain. I'm talking about medical record in the healthcare world, claims in the insurance. And so these kind of transactions today, they are uh, managed through technologies that are decades old. Uh, ADI, API, traditional messaging. And most of the time, uh, there is also tons of paper, especially when the transaction are touching legal aspects, uh, that has to be managed. So what happens is that the enterprise that are transacting, they can transact, but usually they don't have all the information in their ledger to be able to settle, to be able to comply fast. And so the point of distributed ledger technology, which is the code name for enterprise blockchain, like, like a ledger, is that it's going to help uh, an enterprise get all the information to transact. So if I'm selling a house to somebody, I can sign the transaction, but the guy is not going to cut me a check until he knows that I own the house, right? How does he get that? He has to get to something where he can find that. So the first, the first thing you can do with a distributed ledger platform is to transact in real time because you have all the ledger. That usually suppresses a lot of errors. In banking, when you make an error in a certain system, it just costs you up to a million to fix it. Right? And uh, uh, the, the banks are really interested in that to kind of renovate their, their infrastructure. Uh, the, the settlement is a problem too, because if I want to settle a, a transaction, I need to have all the proofs and all the historical data about the transaction. If you send me an instrument, I'm regulated. I have capital frozen. So usually processes of settlement takes days to weeks. That's a lot of money wasted and a bad too much time. So distributed ledger is where they want to, to focus on it. It can help that. It can help transact, settle, and comply in real time. If I go to another industry, let's say supply chain, uh, in the world, I think that uh, less than 60% of the supply chain transactions are automated. Only the big vendors, the big market makers, have automated their ecosystem. It means that 40% is, is still very manual. And if you just take it end to end, there are still silos that are not automated. So that's a problem just to be in business, because supply chain is how can I get in business quick with a new partner. <coughs> it has problem of fraud. You have problem of uh, provenance, counterfeiting, diversion. 
People even show up in ports with fake documents, and I want to grab shipments that are not prepared. <coughs> so with a distributed ledger, you should you, are, you will be able to find that data and detect the fraud. So there's a lot of efficiency in supply chain that can come to that. And here the benefit is to take these distributed processes, automate them, and get full visibility. The third benefit of a, of a technology uh, is uh, around uh, interoperability and data sharing. So if I mean, uh, if I go to my doctor and I want to be treated, my doctor has to rec recover my medical records. How does he do that? How can he automate the claim with my insurance? With smart contracts that are also a, a technology that you know for Ethereum, you, could, you can automate these exchanges and, and streamline these processes. There is tone of uh, improvement for the customer experience or the patient experience. There is also issues uh, at stake on fraud. So that this, these benefits are, are really there. The question you may ask me is how do I know about that and how Sky Republic know about that? The point is that we've been in the business of transaction management for 20 years. I was the CEO for 10 years of a company headquartered in town called Axway. You may know for sure. $300 million, I took the company public in 2011. And with the guys that are coming from Axway too, we did products and help customers for 10 years, uh, 10,000 customers, including nearly all the big names, to do transactions. So we went through the cybersecurity audit of all the big banks. We worked with a lot of central banks in the US, in Europe, you can sense that I have a little accent, and uh, even if I'm American now, um, in South America. So uh, we, we, we really worked on this technology, on this platform, and put in there all the knowledge we grabbed along all these years. So what's different in the Sky Republic platform? So first, it's a, it's a full baked infrastructure like we used to do at Taxway. That's what we do. And we were competing at the time with IBM, Oracle, and guys like that. So it's a full infrastructure that is an equivalent of a hyperledger uh, commercial grade. Right? So, <clears throat> If I take the four main characteristics, so you have a distributed ledger, fine. You can have transactions. The transactions in our platform are enforceable legally. It means that we use certificate from certificate authorities that you can show in front of a judge. Our contracts are also on steroids. We're talking about how it's difficult to interact in the healthcare community, in the insurance community, it's very distributed. Our contract on steroids are able to uh, have all the features that you need to connect distributed processes. So you have privacy option, you have interface for all in the process. Uh, it's very sophisticated. So once you have a contract and that you share that in your ecosystem and everyone has a contract you can transact, you can also build an app on top like you would do with Corda, if you know. So that app is going to help you automate your own process logic, your own business logic. So I'm not a supplier, I'm a manufacturer, I'm a healthcare payer. I have to interact with the contract on one side, and on the back end, I have all my application also that's going to guide me into how to manage the transaction. So in Sky Public, you can do an app, you can even interact with your devices, IoT devices on the background. Four things that I'm, I'm too long. Okay, take it. I accidentally don't know. So you can answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I know. So the, the last thing that is important is that we can use the technology in different kind of ecosystems, centralized, decentralized, distributed, we manage membership. We can bridge contracts, we can fire all them. And the key point also is that technology is built for scale and performance. <coughs> so uh, these large enterprises, in a week or two, they, they generate how much trans, um, uh, as much transaction data that Bitcoin has done for the last since inception. So it has to scale, it has to be performant, it has to provide disaster recovery, and we provide that. So cool. my conclusion is exactly that. So we are raising a new platform. It's built for mission transaction for mission transaction for mission critical transaction. You can transact, settle, comply in real time. You can automate distributed processes and get full visibility, and you can interact and share data. Awesome. Thank you. So, I really didn't know much about Sky Republic. Just introduced it, and I'm really excited because I think we're kind of getting some synergy here in Phoenix around supply chain. So, you know, we had a whole session on supply chain, so 
Let's open it up for a couple of questions, and then I have the last question. Yeah. Any questions, Rick? Yeah. So, um, layman's term, what is mission critical? Would you would you sell your house on Bitcoin? <coughs> Say that again. Would you sell your house on Bitcoin infrastructure or Ethereum infrastructure? Yes. I would. Yes. Would, would, would the bank do that? Yeah. No. No. That's that's the, that's the problem. Problem of liability. Problem of scale. Problem of performance. Problem of privacy. Uh, problem of regulation. Uh, so it's it's a technology that is uh, it's built up for these large enterprises that are very uh, they are security team, risk team. So mission critical is is, is exactly that. So. It's the same thing that uh, it's two cars, two <coughs> blockchain, but one wants to do at 200 miles an hour, and one is just doing 200. The car is, looks like a car, but it's not built exactly the same way. That, that's the thing. All the pieces are improved, not configurable. That's it. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to ask the last question for every lightning <laughs> <laughs> OK. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, how can this community support Sky Republic? What, what would, what, if you had a magic wand, what would you ask of this community? No, we are very interested to be uh, involved in local projects, to be find people that are knowledgeable uh, as much on the technology that we are on the people in the industry. And uh, we are searching for talent, we are searching for everything that is not that people are searching for, but especially you know, people that have projects in blockchain and also maybe to find help about how to find the right stack and stuff like that, or open to help. Awesome. So, what, there are four of you tonight from yes. Sky Republic? Um, your colleagues are there, so please get to know Sky Republic and let's see what we can create regarding collaboration. Okay? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next lightning talk is a, I, I have to issue a disclaimer on this because Jason Horton, who is the co-organizer of Desert Blockchain, is the chief technology officer of CryptoPal, which is our next lightning talk. And uh, so that's just the <coughs> disclaimer. And uh, so it's not a recommendation of CryptoPal or anything else but I think it's a really really exciting project and we have Camille Evans here tonight to tell us a little bit about crypto. Welcome Camille. Thank you. So all of our technology people are on a road show in India right now so you get me tonight um, and um, I am really really excited to be a part of this new um, company it's um, it hopefully will revolutionize uh, the way transactions are done. So first of all, I want to ask how many of you either own or would like to own cryptocurrency? <laughs> uh, that should be everyone here in the room. And I imagine that some of you are business owners and would like to, um, a tool to increase your sales. I'm here to introduce to you a first of the kind application blockchain technology that will help businesses make money, simplify processes for their consumers, and allow contributors an opportunity to get involved with us. First, I'd like to share a use case with you. Uh, I'd like to tell you about a company that has been extremely successful recently, why they have and how you and even they can benefit more with our new technology. Overstock.com, yep. most of us have. You may know their story, um, but their stock has skyrocketed in the last year. Why is that? What are they doing differently than traditional companies? Their secret is that they accept multiple cryptocurrencies as payment for their online goods. With cryptocurrencies entering the global market, 
wouldn't it be nice for businesses to have a piece of that? There are three big barriers we have identified between the traditional centralized applications and decentralized crypto space. Number one, today merchants are not adopting cryptocurrency because of the high complexities of blockchain. There are many more coming into the marketplace and each has its own uniqueness which compounds the complexity even further and creates a barrier to entry. <clears throat> Number two, the current on-chain solutions are simply not scalable and the latency become, has become a problem. The two most well-known cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, cannot handle the volume because their transactions are on-chain. For example, Bitcoin can take minutes up to hours to see your transaction completed. That makes people a little nervous, but there's a good problem here to solve. Number three, there are 6.5 million applications being used by over 4 million people worldwide. Yet most of these applications still lack direct communication with each other and a seamless experience for their users to do transactions. The app-to-app -app integration is missing. Basically, they can't talk to each other. <laughs> kind of like husbands and wives sometimes, right? <laughs> so for example, let's discuss two popular apps in India, Paytm and Ola. Paytm users can easily transact with other Paytm users and Ola users can easily transact with other Ola users. But Paytm users cannot transact with Ola users. What if all app users anywhere in the world could communicate with each other and transact in real time with low fees? What if Marta has a Paytm app and George has an Ola app and they can seamlessly transact using either fiat or cryptocurrency with just a touch of a button. Now, having CryptoPals SDK in between, we are lowering the barrier to entry for app communication and integration. Users will soon be able to transfer value between apps through currency transactions and smart contract interactions, creating an app agnostic environment. SDK and platform solution is a plug and play global solution for businesses that can be integrated into mobile apps, websites, point of sale systems, and IoT devices. We are one of the first teams to integrate with an off chain solution, MicroRaden, to lower the transaction cost and solve the latency problem. The consumer will be able to instantly send, receive, buy, and sell various cryptocurrencies without the high costs, latency, and confusion of the current system. Contributors to the CryptoPal platform will benefit from the increase in usage of the KPX token because it solves a global transaction problem by converting them and distribute them to the appropriate person or business. CryptoCal, CryptoPal reduces the barrier to entry for merchants through its plug and play SDK and helps integrate the cryptocurrency adoption in the day-to-day -day life of consumers. With CryptoPal, the world is a business's oyster. Our platform can become the universal <laughs> way for businesses and consumers to send and receive money, buy and sell goods and services throughout the world with multiple currencies. So, okay. Question? Yeah. Yes, first of all, disclaimer, um, I am not a technologist, so if you've got questions. Easy questions. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay. Easy questions. Yeah. All right, so I'm a merchant. Merchant side? On the merchant side, I'm going to accept a credit card payment 
I want to get paid in crypto. Right. Can you do that? Go from merchant from from a credit card to crypto. I only see the crypto, and I'm not involved in the bank. Let me ask Jason about that. I I believe yes. I know we can do fiat and cryptocurrency. So I will ask Jason about the. So, so far, I haven't seen anyone do that. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. So before we get into my question, Camille. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to say that if you can combine CryptoPal with bridging the communication between husband and wife, <laughs> and sometimes the two are related. But That's right. Financial transactions and breakdown. Not that I'm speaking personally, <laughs> but so if. The, if you had a magic wand and the community could support CryptoPal, what would that look like? Oh, wow. We'd love for you to come by and see us. We're at Galvanize, and I have business cards here. Um, and uh, Jason is our blockchain specialist, and he's just amazing. A lot of you know him. But if this is your first time, keep coming back so you have an opportunity to meet him and everyone else here in the community. We'd love for you to help get the word out. We're going to have a hackathon and uh, dive a little bit deeper and um, you know, into the project. So just helping us get the word out and come by and visit us. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Cool. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our next presentation, Lightning Talk, is by Corey Williams. And Corey has been a long-standing member of Desert Blockchain, and she comes from the banking and credit card uh, realm, American Express. And she has a really cool project that uh, I'll let you go ahead and introduce. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will tell you that we did learn one thing. Um, <coughs> if you have your presentation in uh, one software and Jay's using another software, it might not exactly work the way you want. So we're, Jay and I are kind of tag teaming here and we're going to try to run the sound um, from my laptop with the presentation from his laptop. So uh, please uh, bear with us on this a little bit. Um, you got to go back to the beginning too. Okay. So my, my company is called Conflict Free For You. And this presentation will explain um, how that works. And um, forgive the little sound things in there. It's not really in the presentation, but it's showing up there. Let's see if I can do this the professional way. There we go. How's that? All right. You ready? Let's start it. Are okay. You ready? Yep. Okay. Yours is you got to turn the mic on. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It, it's sort of like dancing. It is going too fast. Can you? Can we make it where you? Where we? I can just turn the slide on yours instead of having it on. Okay. Um. You can you can use that or you can use this. Oh, sorry, that's me. So let's see. I think if you just press this mouse, it will advance the slides. All right. The beauty of live presentations. Okay, let's try it again here. Move the mouse just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. It's estimated that over 78% of Americans have at least one cell phone, laptop, or PC. Most of us have multiple of these items. However, new electronics can contain conflict minerals. These are minerals extracted from a part of the world where conflict is occurring. Minerals in your electronics that are exploited from the mines of Eastern Congo are gold and the three T's. That's tin, tantalum, and tungsten. 
the Democratic and Republican of the Congo is an area where a conflict is occurring because of the minerals <coughs> that are in the ground. It has been named the most dangerous place in the world to be a woman or a girl. Militias there use rape as a weapon of war to fight for control over conflict minerals. How do you get a job at the mines? Usually at gunpoint. They use guerrilla tactics or militant force. Or it is actually the only way you and your family can survive. The mining conditions are very difficult and often in dangerous locations. There are no safety standards. Women and children are forced to carry heavy loads and work at the mines may lead to death. Because of the dot plan control act of 2010, things are improving. Section 1502 creates a reporting requirement for all companies publicly traded in the United States with products containing any of the four conflict minerals. A mine is been certified if there is no presence of armed groups, there are no pregnant women working in the mine, and no extreme forms of child labor. Before the Don Frank Act, in 2010, every mine was under control by an armed group. In 2015, 79% of the mines are no longer in control by armed groups. While progress has been made, there's still a large number of mines that need to be checked and certified. The total number of mines is unknown because there are a lot of small artisanal mines in the vast areas of Eastern Congo. These numbers could be up to a thousand. We need to continue our work and have the support that is currently provided to make that work possible. The journey of minerals from mines to consumer covers a complex landscape of mines, smelters, regulators, banks, manufacturing, and commercial parties. Current supply chains have to rely on intermediaries along the way, with government officials, other manufacturers, accountants, lawyers, and companies who are purchasing the minerals. Today, companies face a number of challenges when trying to create a clear and clean supply chain from minerals to consumer. <clears throat> because a lot of the work is done manually, it's a very labor-intensive and expensive process. The mine inspections also <clears throat> need to increase and should take place every six months to continue certification. A number of companies have to call all their suppliers for details Again, time consuming and labor intensive. And outside of those challenges, the current administration of the United States is talking about suspending data. This could include the supply chain reporting requirements. What if technology could reduce the challenges and help create a clean supply chain as well as drive consumers to a conflict free electronic device? We can, using a blockchain distributed ledger. This is a distributed database that is used to maintain a continuously growing list of records that we call blocks. Each block contains a timestamp. They cannot be altered. They're verifiable, and it creates a recording of each transaction as the conflict minerals move from the mine to the manufacturer. <coughs> using a blockchain distributed ledger, we reduce the cost to companies to create a clear supply chain from the mines to the manufacturer. On top of that, we want to drive consumers to purchase conflict-free electronics. With a clear supply chain, electronics can be certified conflict-free. Consumers will be able to go to a website to verify where the minerals that are in their electronics are coming from. Consumers can use conflict free review to research electronics before they make a purchase. That way they're more educated when they make their purchase and they can verify that their electronics they're purchasing are conflict free. If they would input the making model of the electronic they were interested in purchasing or have already purchased. <laughs> I would 
This particular farm has gold from the Gavali mine in eastern Congo. The site tells a little bit about what life is like at the mine and where it's located. From the Congo Free for You website, consumers can use social media to report that they purchased a conflict-free phone or another electronic, and they can share that information with their friends and family and encourage them to follow along by purchasing their own conflict-free electronics. Okay, thank you very much for being patient with that. There was a, a cart going through, there was blockchain flying through, but it might show up here, but it gives you a, a good idea of what what's happening. Um, basically, every time we buy electronics, um, here or anywhere else in the world, there's four minerals in here that are that are fueling the longest running war in the world today in Eastern Congo. Now, the, because of the Dodd-Frank Act since 2010, we've made huge progress in, in improving um, the, mine, the life of the mines and certifying mines without blockchain even being a part of the discussion. But what we get back from the companies is it's expensive, it's labor intensive. Um, Chris, you brought up that there were some times where there'd be some information here and then there'd be a gap and then there'd be information here. That's that somebody has to make a lot of phone calls. And so it's, it, supply chains are not a perfect um, situation, are not in a perfect situation at this particular moment. And I can't speak for all of them because I don't know all of them. And, and as you all know, everything we touch, everything we wear, everything we do, comes from some sort of a supply chain. So in this particular case though, the companies say it's expensive. They're gonna to have to add a lot of money to the iPhones if they want us, if they want to be certified conflict free. So with blockchain, what we've been able to do is develop that that they don't have to add a lot of money. It'll actually re reduce their cost. I don't know if they'll pass it on to us or not, but it will reduce their cost because it will be a lot easier for them to keep track of their supply chain and where those minerals are coming from and, and, and be able to say they are for sure coming from mines that have been certified conflict free. So any questions? Yes, sir. So if I have a bit of gold, uh, what tanks it and proves that it's from a conflict so in today's process. and that's an excellent question and thank you very much in today's world and that it will continue this way they have a tagging system so they bring out some gold from the mine it goes in a bag and there's a, a, a tag then that stays with that and so and the tag is then monitored and the number associated with the tag so again the, those who have worked in blockchain think oh wow good we've already got something that's tracked it's just tracked on paper, by hand, in software, then in a different <laughs> software. Um, so a, a lot of things are in place that can be put in a blockchain and then be, be more visible. Um, it takes out the corruption too, because let's say the gold comes out of this mine, it weighs a thousand pounds. That, that'd be really a lot of money. Okay, let's say it weighs five pounds, <laughs> but okay, it weighs five pounds. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's going through Rwanda, going to a smelter, and it's four pounds. You're like, what the heck? So that also helps. Okay, thank you, Corey. You're welcome. You know, before I ask my last question, um, <laughs> um, I'd just like to point out that, you know, we are in a realm where there's a whole new tool set for social good, social impact, and social activism. <laughs> You know, this, what you're proposing, wouldn't have been possible without this decentralized trust model. Absolutely. And uh, Jason, who's not with us, who's been part of a team that won the, uh, a month-long hackathon through consensus, has created a carbon removal trading platform that takes a whole new approach to global warming and carbon removal and so forth using a marketplace mechanism. So, you know, what, what you're up to, what Jason's up to, we've got a whole new tool set here to, to have an impact worldwide in issues that are <coughs> important. Absolutely, and, and we can, you know, if we bring up the lives of other people around the world, we bring up everyone's <coughs> lives. And um, what what you were talking about, Chris, is being able to uh, 
do some money back and forth. And you were also talking about that. You know, there's there we we know banks, but there's a lot of places in the world where there isn't even a bank. So so we open up an entire new way of doing business um, around the world using blockchain and using projects that we've heard from today. Cool. Yeah. So one more question. The last question is the magic wand question is how can this community support you and conflict? Well, I think I think a few things is first just now the education, but as you if you hear of folks or people um, working in this realm or thinking of this realm or uh, supply chain people, I think for, I truly believe collaboration is the way to get things done. So and that's and, and I know Jay does too. That's why he works so hard to bring this group together. So the more of us we can uh, collaborate and work on it um, would be great because this this supply chain is not going to be able to be run on a laptop. It's huge already. It's it's a very very large supply chain. When you think of moving minerals out of mines in Africa into electronics all over the world, it's a humongous supply chain. So it's going to. It's going to take a lot of us working on it. So any information, I'll be here too. I'll have my cards. Any information um, to share would be great. So thank you very much. Ladies, are you ready to present? <laughs> OK. So in the realm of social impact, the next lightning talk is going to be about using applying blockchain to nonprofits. So um, we have Judy and Inga, and I'll just let you guys take it away. You don't have slides or do you have a uh, website? Have or a anything? video. You have a video. Yeah. Videos scare me because <laughs> <laughs> if, if we lose the Google Hangout, um, promise it's really scary. What's that? It's really scary one. Oh, it's a scary one. <laughs> um, is there any way you can just turn the video around and play it for them on full screen? Or? Oh, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. We this, okay, well, this setup with the Google one. Hangouts is really, really finicky, and we need right, So what do I do? Um, why don't you take it, turn it around? And play it. How long is the video? Um, about an hour and a half. You can play it to the video camera. Yeah. Or for the video camera. Can you share the URL? Yeah, why don't you just share the URL? I can put the URL up. Um, and no, no, I don't trust you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we need a blockchain to resolve this. Yeah, we do. Uh, I'm gonna be bold. Okay, why don't you talk? I, uh, my name is Judy Mascarina, and I'm actually here. Um, this is my second uh, meetup, and I met Ingrid uh, last month. Uh, <clears throat> I was here interested in learning more about blockchain technology for my own personal purposes, but I started talking to Inga about um, the possibility of helping my friend Zaysan uh, raise funds for his nonprofit, which is called The Quest. And uh, The Quest is about uh, saving kids from sex trafficking, predominantly in the Southeast Asia space. And uh, since the quest has been around, which has been about three years. They have saved over 850 children and a very minimal budget. I think so far he has, uh, we have, it's cost about $41,000. And that includes, there's two issues here. The first issue is um, raising money to uh, actually perform the rescues. And then the second portion is, um, once the children are rescued, uh, we have to maintain them, retain them, so they don't go back into the market and uh, get resold. So um, that's what we are encountering right now. And he became the quest became a, a 5013C in California as of past uh, past May, and uh, 
So Ingrid told me that, you know, doing this uh, donation on the website uh, in cryptocurrency would be beneficial um, for us to raise funds for that cause. <coughs> Um, you know what? I totally lost the link. Okay. Let's we'll we'll post the link. Yeah, the we can send it out. Yeah, yeah send it out. There are some yeah. sobering so. statistics about human trafficking, according to UNICEF. Uh, Twenty-one million people are trafficked around the world. It's a very big industry. Thirty-two billion dollars in profits, and uh, most of the victims, uh, eleven million seven hundred thousand, are concentrated in Southeast Asia. So Zayson works uh, with a, a group of about 500 people. They're mostly volunteers, including some veterans. And um, they are now, uh, the children are spread out uh, among safe houses and 23 orphanages. And um, these orphanages are have taken these kids in, but it does cost the children, uh, it costs $8 per child per month. So we have to raise funds for the rescues and also the care for the children. We also discussed, uh, Ingrid and I discussed about uh, perhaps creating uh, academies uh, for the kids to learn computer. Do you want to watch Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Uh, so when she told me about what it is that they do, I could see a lot, a lot of potential and blockchain capabilities to help them out. Um, so we started doing, working on that. Um, I, we did, first of all, I redid the website. It was a little <laughs> funny. Um, so I, um, I moved the website to the <coughs> Google Cloud, I think. Yeah to have more stability and be faster. Um, I added the opportunity for people to donate in Bitcoin and PayPal, send a check, donate in, I think, like three or four or five other currencies. Um, then- What's the website up? What's the domain name? It doesn't have the name. It's still in the, okay. on the so dev server. We're working. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't. I'll show you have it all. I'll send the link. Um, and I added another feature that I think is really, really cool. It um, it allows for visitors to click the button and start mining the coin directly into the address of those wonderful people. That's all just the click of the button and give the time to the process on their computer to donate the money to the people who need them. So, so it's basically like a peer-to-peer, -peer non-profit, possibly truly, um, truly non-profit. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's a- uh, It creates peer-to-peer -peer contributions. Mm -hmm, it's, are, are you mining on a dedicated server? No, I'm mining on the user's computer. And what coins are you mining? Um, I think Monero. Monero. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Every cool. user gives out his processor time to the niche. Okay. And the yeah. So it's a it's a shared resource right. construct as um, well. Yeah. So that's um, number one. Number two. Um, obviously, we want to implement the blockchain solution for the nations and have the transparency and usage and whatnot. Um, and we were, I don't know, we were concentrating on Ethereum a lot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, there are great solutions for the nations already implemented, um, really nice ones. I think we had a beef with the caring a little bit. <laughs> so we decided not to go that route. And um, I'm probably going to do Zcash for you, maybe Bitcoin. Because it's difficult to use it. But yeah, something like that. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, it's, I love the spirit of it for sure. So, so any other question? You mentioned that there were some solutions out there already. Are there already um, blockchain solutions that nonprofits are using to track donations? Yeah. You know the name of them? Um, give the uh, IO, something like that. Okay. Something like they have your name. I have to look it up. Okay. Be awesome if you could post that up. They were sponsoring DEF CON. Okay. Yeah, so they, they, they are stable. They're creating a lot of community-oriented blockchain solutions, so to speak, that are contributing. So they are hippie. They are hippie. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so how can this how can this community support this project? Um, well, well, when I send a website link to the new website, just go and just mine it. <laughs> In what's your date that you think you'll be live? Oh, with the map sign? Yeah. As soon as my survey goes up. Okay. okay. It's okay. <clears throat> a month? I, I, no, I, I, no, it's not a month. It's, it's fully working. Um, I ran a couple. Firewall rules this morning and I screwed up something along the way. <laughs> and, so unusual and, with technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Very Thank nice. you. Okay, so our last lightning talk. I'm going to combine the last lightning talk with our special guest because the two are related. And um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce Eric Cardenas, who is a second year law student at ASU. Let's, uh, see you. Eric has a, a keen interest in blockchain and interesting, what, so why don't you go ahead and talk about your project, how the community can assist you, and then we'll introduce the special guest. And, I'll, and we actually have two special guests. Uh, I feel that sounds good. I um, we'll just want to say hi to my mom and dad because they're watching this from Houston, Texas. So <laughs> that's where I'm from. So I love you too. <laughs> but yeah, so um, hi, my name is Eric Gardenas. I'm a current second year law student at ASU Santa Day O'Connor College of Law. Um, when Jay asked me to give this talk about my paper that I'll be writing this coming spring, I was surprised and honored, but immediately accepted this opportunity because I know that it's important. Um, so if I seem a little nervous, just know that when I accepted Jay's offer, I didn't know that I'd be taking a final in 14 hours, which is tomorrow morning. So just bear with me here, everyone, and um, just know that it isn't as polished as I would like it to be. So here we go. So next semester, I'll be doing an independent research project um, on next generation or third generation blockchain policy here in Arizona under Professor Gary Marchant, who's going to be my advisor. He's over there. He's a um, director for the Center for Law, Science, and Innovation here at uh, ASU. I say third generation because Arizona is already one of the states leading the nation with forward-looking blockchain policy, thanks to our very own Representative Jeff Weninger in the Arizona legislature. And we even have an advocate at the federal level in Congressman David Schweiker. At the federal level, Congressman Schweiker is the co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, alongside Congressman Jared Polis of Colorado. Together, they introduced a bipartisan bill this past, this, this past fall called the Cryptocurrency Fairness Act. When the IRS classified digital currency as property in 2014, it made even the smallest of cryptocurrency transactions the same as trading stocks, thus subject to the same tax as stock, which disincentivized consumers from using virtual currencies to pay for everyday goods and services. This legislation that they introduced would allow consumers to make small purchases with cryptocurrency up to $600 without burdensome reporting requirements for the consumer. Here in Arizona, the first generation um, policy by Representative Weninger is HB 2417, which was introduced and passed this past year. This innovative law allows blockchain signatures to be legally recognized and help legitimize the smart contracts as legally enforceable contracts here in Arizona. Some of us had the opportunity just a few months ago to see the Arizona Attorney General's office 
Come talk to he us here at Desert Blockchain on the regulatory sandbox for fintech companies that incentivizes companies to come to Arizona and use blockchain to innovate our financial sector. This second generation legislation should be passed this coming spring, but because it may only apply to the financial sector, there's much more to be done. Um, I know that people like Mark Goldstein, who's right here with us today, and others are helping to make this legislation more comprehensive, and I hope that it will be. My paper would be third generation policy, and will be written under the, the assumption that the second generation policy will be introduced and hopefully passed in 2018. It will seek to provide clear guidance in regards to Arizona's existing money transmission licenses law, which are currently unclear as to whether they cover digital currency businesses. The current laws may also require non-custodial digital currency businesses to be licensed, which would be harmful to businesses who seek to issue a token but do not necessarily consider it a digital currency. If we make this policy clear, we will not dissuade businesses from coming to Arizona to innovate with blockchain. This paper will also seek to broaden the state's acceptance of blockchain technology for use beyond the financial technology sector, into healthcare, the supply chain, the legal field, and more. This will allow Arizona to continue to lead the nation in innovative blockchain policies. So now you're asking, why should Arizona do this? Why should Arizona help lead the nation to adopt blockchain-friendly policies? Well, because the state of Arizona and its citizens have long been beacons of freedom in this country, and we should help lead the way in lockstep with states like Illinois, because blockchain represents granting people even more freedom than we currently have. Many people think of freedom as freedom to, freedom to speak, freedom to vote, freedom to start my own small business, freedom to whatever, and this is fine, but what is equally important is the notion of freedom from. Blockchain technology has the potential to make archaic systems more efficient. It has the potential to increase transparency in these systems, and these, this increases accountability, which in turn decreases corruption while building trust. So when we think of freedom, we also need to think of freedom from. Freedom from opaque systems that benefit from the fact that they operate without transparency. Freedom from inefficiencies in systems like the supply chain, a $54 trillion industry, even with its inefficiencies, that often takes advantage of small businesses lower on the road so that someone higher in the chain gets a bigger cut. There are already blockchain companies working on solutions to these problems, even one here in the state of Arizona. And maybe the most important freedom, freedom from old forms of security that have affected many people sitting in this room today. Our current security systems are outdated. This was made even more evident this past year alone. With notable hacks at Wells Fargo, Yahoo, and most recently Equifax, a hack that I was personally affected by, which saw the data of 143 million consumers get stolen, Equifax knew about the hack five months before it was disclosed to the public, and three executives even sold off $1.8 million of shares before this information was publicly released. I don't know about y'all, but I didn't know that my social security information and more was given to a third party without my consent. There are blockchain companies trying to give you, the citizen, the consumer, greater protection than these systems currently offer by putting your information on the far more secure blockchain while also putting this information in the control of the person who should be controlling it, you. I often hear people say, Eric, this is just the way things have always been done. Well, now we are in a position to change, innovate, and improve. Arizona can lead the way, and I hope that my paper can help to do just that. Arizona can lead, Arizona can, and should, and will be a hotbed for the most innovative blockchain companies with the right policies in place that allow this technology to flourish and thrive in this state that cares so much about freedom and freedom to innovate. If the United States does not act soon, other countries already are and will act, thus leaving us behind in the next wave of technological advancement and economic growth. Together, all of us in this room have, potential, have the potential to help lead this change. And I look forward to writing this paper with guidance from many of you so that we can make this happen. Thank you.
Dan has to go study. And he has to go study, I'm sure. The good news, he has one of his professors here. So yeah, there you go. That could be an I don't know where he is, Dan. <laughs> um, so how can this community uh, support your paper, and how can we move this forward? I mean, it, it's exactly like I said, and it's why I thought it was so important to give this talk in the first place, even with my final tomorrow morning. It's just the more that people find out about this technology and the people who, me included, think that it's the next iteration of the internet, it's the next step that the internet should have always taken or should take going forward. Um, and then, I mean, just that that's one way, just knowledge, spreading it, telling people. And then, I mean, just the fact that I'm here in Arizona, I'm just so fortunate that I, I chose to attend ASU Law. Almost went to University of Houston because they were offering me quite substantial amount of money, but it looks like I wouldn't even be here right now. I wouldn't have come to this first desert blockchain meeting where I met Professor Todd Taylor, who introduced me to Professor Marchin, and then now I'm a founding fellow at the ASU Law's Blockchain Interest Policy Group. It's just, everything has been moving so fast ever since I discovered this. And I'm just, I'm, I'm happy that I've met people like Mark and that I, I'm able to be in this room with so many people that are, are small business owners, that are merchants, that are developers. I mean, my, my roommate Adam is a developer and he is the one that got me onto this this past summer. Like, he's like, hey, have you, you heard about blockchain? Like, what's blockchain? He's like, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like, it's Bitcoin, but a lot more. And I was like, I think I bought something like back in 2013 in my freshman year. And, and you know, it's just everything has been going ever since then. So, I mean, the way that the community can help it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm open to any and all suggestions. I haven't been the research project with things. I'm going to be getting credit for this. So all the work that I've been doing in my free time is finally going to be rewarded. I'm going to get school credit that, that allows me to do this research, that, that allows me to write this paper, and allows me to make it comprehensive. And, and with the help of this community, Desert Blockchain, and the state of Arizona, it, I know it's going to be a really exciting and fun paper. And I mean... I'm just very thankful for, for the opportunity to just be even writing this and very be here. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm going to go, um, I got a little technical issue to deal with, and I'm going to grab a couple of seats. But I would like to introduce everyone to Representative Jeff Winninger of uh, the Arizona House of Representatives. Um, Know. He sponsored the first legal signature on the blockchain bill here in Arizona, which was passed. And that, in my view, was a key piece of putting Arizona on the map in the leading, uh, in leadership in the realm of innovation around uh, policy. And I think that is huge. <coughs> Together with Congressman Schweikert, we really, really have an opportunity to put Arizona at the forefront of policy. And for those of you that might not know, I'm going to post a, a, an article that just came out the day before yesterday. But one of the leaders in the blockchain space said that governance is the key area that's missing for innovation in this space. And it, that's so on point. So between Eric and Jeff and, and Gary and the other people and, and uh, Congressman Schweikert, we really have an opportunity to create something that's going to be powerful in this area. So, so Jeff, if, if you'll tell us a little bit about what you're interested in yeah. putting out to the community. And everybody in this room tonight has an opportunity <clears throat> to participate in this realm of innovation. So, Jeff, tell us what you got in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you for I'm gonna uh, deal with some the great introduction. And wow, I mean, it's kind of tough to follow Eric here. That was <laughs> really impressive and, uh, and moving. It shows you the passion that everybody has for this kind of subject. Uh, real quick about me, I'm, I'm in the restaurant business. I moved in from Wichita, Kansas in 1993. Opened up restaurants. Uh, we have three. Uh, between Tempe and Chandler, and we have two kiosks in Sky Harbor Airport. Um, so I understand, uh, I think you were talking about, somebody was talking about the, the business and how to make things easier for business. And 
I understand how blockchain is going to transform us. I mean, on one end, and it's no disrespect to the traditional companies, on one end, I have payroll companies who want to take, you know, 40 grand of mine two or three days before payrolls do, hold on to it, and then I have credit card companies on the other end wanting to hold, you know, not giving me my money for two days afterwards. All of a sudden, I've got to have a, a sixty or seventy thousand dollar cushion just to survive. Comes. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of businesses, and what this kind of thing of speeding things up can can do for us, just as right the business people. Um, I did write the crowdfunding law a few years ago uh, that legalized equity crowdfunding here in Arizona, and I got to say. Congressman Schweiker is a, is a good friend, and uh, he pesters me uh, very well in getting these things done in, in his office. Helps me tremendously helping write the legislation stuff. He is truly a national leader on uh, these issues. Um, we talked about 2417 a little bit and, and what that did. Um, I would love, Eric, for you to testify before our Commerce Committee on some of these hopeful blockchain bills we're going to do this year. Um, I think being helpful and, and anybody else. Uh, so, so the things we're kind of looking at this year, and I'm not, I, I was joking outside that I probably know me and four others in the legislature of the 90 of us know the most about blockchain, but that's not saying a whole lot. So you're the experts. I'm looking, uh, you know, for your input and advice. Uh, the attorney general uh, asked me to run this financial uh products testing, the, the sand, regulatory sandbox uh, on fintech items this year. So I'm going to be running that. Uh, we're definitely still looking for input on that. They have a, kind of something written, but they understand and know. I know they came and talked uh, here that uh, there's going to be changes in different people and different things. So we have that. Uh, then there's numerous other things I'm looking at. I'm looking at, uh, we're going to talk about this MTL and, and whether or not uh, you know, the digital currency is treated just the same as banks, or do we need to relax these things? And these are these are things that kind of, I think, will be the theme this year, and, and all, not just blockchain, but different things, is is reducing regulations on businesses and, and people here in the state of Arizona. Um, so looking at that and how we change that, I'm looking at doing um, a proof of concept in state government. I mean, government needs to be efficient, too and needs to save money and time and everything. So coming up with something where we could test the blockchain next to the traditional things that we're doing right now. So, uh, you know, I've joked about fishing license or cattle brands. Uh, we talked about, you know, possibly the corporation commission or somewhere where we can still have the, the normal process, but then look at it and say, okay, you got a blockchain next to it. Uh, it worked, it's secure. Um, um, it's efficient. We think possibly if we deploy this, that you would get rid of any employees, but through attrition, do you reduce the amount of people uh, you need working that our tax dollars are, are going towards? Um, I talked a little bit about this and, and thinking about uh, the bill we did last year. You know, everybody, I've had regulators, different people tell me, well, what did? Can't you just go ahead and do it in all the industries now? And that question is definitely unanswered because um, let's take title companies, for example. You know, just because we've allowed it, does that mean that it would be insurable if a lot of that replaced from that? Would it be recognized by the lender? Uh, would the title be recognized by a uh, secure So there's a lot of things in, you know, these industries are going to protect themselves when it comes down to it. And, and once you start kind of opening it up at a more granular level and saying, yes, you should be able to do this, you know, then the pushback comes uh, probably in. And how are we going to look at that? Uh, Nevada, I, in some research I was doing, I saw did an interesting law this last year as well. Um, it got signed after ours, so that was good. Um, <laughs> but it, basically uh, preempted cities somewhat. Cities get very creative. Notice I was a city council member for eight years in Chandler. Uh, dealt with Intel, a lot of the technology there. Um, but certain cities and stuff, they, they get creative. They're like you, but they're you know, creative there where they're trying to figure out, well, where can we get more revenue from? You know, 
And so Nevada did a kind of a preemptive thing where they said, you know, you're not going to tax or regulate the deployment of a blockchain uh, at the city level or put fees on it or this or that. Now, a lot of people might think, well, you know, they wouldn't. Um, but uh, they would, and we just don't want any more hurdles. We don't want, you know, economic development is at the state level, and we don't want any, you know, little tiny hurdles from individual cities getting in the way of that. That's not to say you can't be taxed on the profits of your business that has a, you know, that deploys blockchain and the profits you do on that, but no fees or regulations on just the deployment of a blockchain. And uh, I'm sure you have a lot of that ideas too. That's just a few of them. I'm open to anything, uh, um, you know, talking about it. What's going to help? I mean, you're, you're the users, you're the people deploying it. So, what's going to help you further it, make it easier, make uh, things more successful in an expedient manner here in Arizona? So, how can, well, let's open it up for questions. I think we have a real opportunity to create an innovative collaboration, not only in creating blockchain in a Arizona government context, but also a collaboration between the innovators and the policymakers. And and if if we could, you know, have some breakthroughs in that realm, now all of a sudden um, there's a whole new horizon of opportunity that I think uh, opens up. So Absolutely. Absolutely. How, can, how can this community support what you're interested in creating, Jeff? Uh, communicate, help us come up with ideas, help us refine the ideas. I mean, I want you, I want people from this group at the table, you know, because you're going to see things we're not going to see. And believe me, legislators are not uh, perfect or, you know, a lot of times not the smartest people in the room. Maybe most people, I mean, we do all right, but we take well, our stuff and we hand yeah, it off to ledge council. The lawyers write it. So if I don't know technical things and, and problems that are going to be on the horizon, um, because I don't know it technically to the uh, to the degree that you do, then it's going to create problems. And you got to go back and fix it the next year, and you got to fix this, and you're going to have a lot of what ifs. Well, what if this? There's always going to be the nightmare scenarios that people are going to bring up. So the more we can uh, fix that stuff up front. The more you know, the hurdles that you can say well, you're going to run into this or that, uh, the better. Cool. So I guess. Do you, do you have any kind of time frame on the prototype that you have? Well, I mean, I'm open to running multiple bills this year on blockchain. Um, so, but the time frame is short. We start session like first week of January, and four days after we start session, we have a seven bill limit. Meaning, I can only drop seven more bills after that. And unfortunately, I, I run way too many bills sometimes. But so to try to drop everything before that day, because things are still popping up and you're trying uh, to do different things. So, um, you know, and then Christmas is coming up, and then a lot of the staff members of the Ledger Council, right? Everything are going to be off. So, uh, you know, the next week, week and a half, if, if I can get with people and start getting things, then we can get. At least it's churning, you know, if we come to an agreement, uh, the different bills churning in Ledge Council. Have you looked at what other uh, sovereignties and municipalities around the world are doing with some of these prototypes? For, for example, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates are, are doing some really groundbreaking things with their governmental services on blockchain. So, um, no, I, I've heard that uh, some of them are trying to, I've heard Dubai is trying to be yeah, completely on it within so many years. Um, so not a ton, but I, I think it, as far as deploying them in, deploying it in government, there's going to be a learning curve. There's a learning curve, for, you know, there's still a learning curve with me and, and other legislators, but the more, you know, I was thinking about maybe we need a legislative blockchain caucus so, you know, that we get a synergy of people around that really knowing, uh, like Congressman Schweiger has in DC, really knowing the the issue. So um, I want to go fast, but at the same time, certain things are going to have to, you know, go in steps and and uh, be able to kind of prove the concept to a lot of people. Okay, if you don't mind, um, do you think uh, small steps like the like the fishing licenses and 
the you know for cattle and do you think that's the best way for Arizona to like to quickly start developing blockchain kind of technology well, no. been, or like what do you I mean that it's a good question I I want to go very fast okay. with the private sector yeah. um, and freeing up <coughs> and giving you the ability to go fast the government part I don't want to go slow on purpose but I, I I'd like a proof of concept for everybody in that realm when we're dealing with taxpayer money and stuff um, so if that's, if if we, if some of us in the community could build a prototype, put a prototype up, let's say for the fishing license application, and actually show that to some of the policymakers, would that be beneficial? Yeah, it would, it would be beneficial getting something like that through. Um, I don't, you know, for a demonstrative. Uh, yeah, for demonstrating. It doesn't. I, I don't fishing. know the legalities of. of, of, of we might not have a competitive process. Um, you know, to do the whole thing and deploy it um, for real if it passes. But yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, questions? I'm sure there's questions. Sure. All right. Um, thank you for your good work. Uh, could you give us any thoughts on initial coin offerings and whether the state has a role in, in that regulatory area? Yeah, I mean, I, I participate in those a little bit, so I understand them uh, a little bit. Um, you know, some of the arenas that the things that comes up is, you know, taxes and different things like that. But uh, I think it kind of might go into the, that fall under the MTL thing, maybe, uh, where it's, is, it's is it a bank, is it security, you know, and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, some clarity in that, I think, might be good. I, I want everybody to be on a level playing field. So if it is apples to apples, I, I don't necessarily think it is, but it, you know, as you can say, it's a whole lot of different things. But uh, you know, when Uber came, I was I love the disruption, but at the same time, I want the ta uh, the taxis being able to compete on a level playing field. So I was, I'd, you know, I'd have to raise Uber's uh, regulations, just lower the taxis. You know, this is the way I wanted to go, and that's pretty much what we did. So um, I'm excited about initial point offerings. I, just dabbling a little bit. I'm not spending thousands of dollars, but you know, a few dollars here and there. It's exciting, and, and I hope uh, I hope companies can be here doing them and deploying them. So I'm open to looking at anything that that makes that possible. You know, I talked to a couple of people who will just say that they're um, you know, working government, and they're like, "Well, you know, I think you can do that already, and you can do this and do that." I'm like. Businesses want predictability, they want safety, they want to know that somebody's not going to knock on there and say, you can't do that, you're being fined, and this and that. So until there is clarity, so sometimes you do have to write a law, even if they think it's understood, that says this is allowed. And so we, we might need to do some cleanup with clarity and stuff like that. Cool. So, I, I would, thank you, Jeff. I, I'd like to interrupt and, and just invite <coughs> Professor Marchant to come up and talk a little bit about where ASU's it at in this process and how there might be some collaboration with the academics as well as the people that are the technologists and the policy makers. So well, let me just say a couple words from here and let sure. people ask questions that <laughs> So yeah, so we have a really great program at the law school. We have a lot of great students. Uh, I don't know if you know, but our law school sort of focuses on law and technology. That's why I came here 20 years ago from DC is because this was the one law school that really decided to focus a lot on technology space and like the faculty and, we, and blockchain and bitcoins are, are one of the areas we're really focused on. We got a lot of great students. Eric is one. Uh, Jason Lonsworth here is another one. He's actually a lawyer who came back to school to do advanced degree and focus in on these kind of issues. We have a lot of great students that are really interested in this issue. And, and you know, as, as Jay was saying, we have sort of all the pieces lined up in Arizona with like the congressman, with the president. Of the and uh, the attorney general as well. Attorney general, uh, companies here, we have some great lawyers who are practicing in the field here. John Lynch is here, just an example one. And so we have sort of all the pieces in place to become a real leader in this, and, and our law school really wants to be part of that. One of the things we're doing is we're going to have a series of four uh, lunch hour talks on sort of the legal aspects of blockchain in the, in the spring that will be free and open to anybody who's interested. So if you're interested in that, and hopefully. Our, our, we'll be able to come and speak at one of those. We've invited Congressman uh, Schweikert as well. 
a few lawyers to, to sort of look at what are these legal issues and, and how can Arizona, working with the project there, is leading really become a leader in this area. So thanks and uh, not in your district. So I was wondering if you could, when bills come up that need some push, you could let Jane know so you could post it on the blockchain so we can call our representatives and say, hey, we'll come next. Absolutely. Great idea. Absolutely. That the more help like that, uh, the better. And a lot of people do respond to this kind of either new economy, technology, different thing. They know that's where it's going, and, and those voices being heard down there do matter. Mark, hey, just uh, you know, I represent the Arizona Technology Council Public Policy Committee. We've now spent two years developing uh, our recommendations and state policy, and they're falling in line. Um, I think the most important advance, as we talked earlier is potentially in parallel with the uh, regulatory sandbox to do what some other states have done in money transmission licensure relaxation or parallel process but we'll bring the tech council it's 850 member companies many of which are fintech only a few of which are blockchain fintech but we still represent a broad fintech array uh, to the support of these efforts. And again, we thank you for your leadership. So, so other questions? Yes, um, John. <clears throat> I'm a doctor, uh, attorney of Perkins Career, our, our blockchain practice. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you uh, for all your efforts in this space. Um, one, one question I had was uh, in addition to the, the list of issues that you're looking at, um, has, has the legislature been looking at, or do you think they will be looking at the uh, Uniform uh, law that came out recently on um, virtual currency and, and potentially implementing that or maybe shying away from it for various reasons. I was wondering if, if it was something that you think would be in the area of the coming session. Uh, possibly. Uh, you and somebody else brought it up, I think, uh, Mark, that outside. So I'm, I'm, I haven't read over it yet, but I'm going to. And, uh, you know, I'm. I'm uh, I love good ideas, and uh, and I share the credit, and you know. But if it's if it's a good idea and it's going to help, I mean, we're talking about a lot of issues, and I, I want to run and get through as many good ideas as I can. But there's a there's a handicapping in my head that goes along whether or not. Okay, how long is this going to take to get done? How much resistance? Are you? How much incumbent resistance from uh, businesses outside, which wouldn't make me not do it, but. It's all a formula I'm building in my head because I <clears throat> I don't run bills just to get attention. I'm com a competitor. I mean, that's um, whether it's me building businesses or whatever, playing Monopoly with my kids. I, I'm not letting anybody win. I want to win. So, uh, and to me, winning well, the ultimate thing of winning is getting a bill signed by the governor, uh, which he's been very friendly to these kinds of things. I mean, uh, when we talk to him, I mean that. The narrative that's been put out there in Arizona is, is, I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's really built these last few years. And it's little things. Sometimes it's not maybe groundbreaking for the entire state, but when you send signals to Uber and driverless cars and these different things, it starts building. And the narrative gets there that Arizona really, Tom from Chandler, my district, you know, always bumping up Chandler. Um, Arizona is open for business. Arizona is where you want to come if you want to lower regulation. I, I do think this will be the year, you know, there's usually a theme of, of the year of the legislature, and I think this year will be water, but I think it'll be uh, uh, lessening regulations, you know, within a, a safe way. I'm running another bill based on home-based businesses. I mean, when I was a uh, councilman in Chandler, we had a, a, a you have to come there if you're going to open up a home-based business sometimes or you're going to incorporate business. And so there was an accountant who was going to do accounting at home. He might have had a UPS truck come every other day. I was the only guy who voted and said, well, yeah, of course he can run his business out of his house. Didn't have any employees or anything. But uh, so running a bill based on that, because if we're going to be the entrepreneur capital, people are going to start some of the businesses in their bedroom or their office at home. So uh, anything I can do to foster that kind of environment for Arizona, uh, I'm open to. Awesome. Short of raising time. <laughs> uh, I, in 
Jeff, I'd also like to point out that um, there's this whole realm of decentralized web and decentralized networks, decentralized uh, or distributed ledger technologies is opening up an opportunity for sort of silos to start to look at, okay, how do we col collaborate? How can we work together? And that's a real challenge because everybody's got the mindset of, hey, you know, we want to be competitive, we want to win, and we want to do this and that. So I think we've got an opportunity to see if there's a way for the municipalities in Arizona to collaborate. Yeah. So that it's not like, you know, Chandler winning over Phoenix or Tempe or whatever. And there's also, and Mark and I have had some conversations um, with some policymakers about, you know, is there a way for the states to collaborate? You know, do we really have to um, compete with Nevada and Illinois and Delaware and so forth? And so maybe it's optimistic, uh, Pollyanna, whatever, but I think there's that's part of the conversation. I definitely believe in collaboration. Though. Chandler, we have Gangplank and all these different people, you know, they kind of collaborate together. Uh, we kind of did something with the nonprofits in Chandler where we saw them duplicating services a lot. And we kind of talked to them and said, you know, help each other out because sometimes the nonprofits were competing. So I absolutely agree. Stand uh, but at the same time, you know. Yeah, we're trying to bring home the bacon for Arizona. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a politician. Come on, we'll, we'll settle with Chandler and the There you go. Okay, East Valley. East Valley, but some reciprocity. That's right. I'll think about it on my hour and a half drive. <laughs> well, um, I'm gonna conclude for tonight because we're almost at eight thirty, and um, again, you know, we have to be out of here by nine. Um, but the idea is to move next door to Canyon 49 and continue the conversation and continue the networking, basically. So, uh, any any final? Um, so he he mentioned he needs some help in the next week, week and a half. How would you like to coordinate that? If people are interested, should they contact you then? Yeah, and you I, be the point of contact. I think uh, the way it can work is. Um, let me connect with you, Jeff, and we'll see what might work and mark and a few of well, us. Well, I'm, I'm planning on putting together a very small meeting, not a big one, on you know, get the bankers there, see if we can get them not to be resistant. You know, really, uh, everyone that has legitimate input should have a way of funneling it. I'm working towards a very small meeting to try to reach some consensus on uh, perhaps some of the terms of the regulatory standards. <laughs> and there can't be 20 people or 30 people in the room. That, I'm that, talking more about this project where he wants to commission <clears throat> licenses. Yeah, yeah. We'll, needs people to help build that. It's it's on the table. I think there's I got some ideas about how it can be done, how something can be put up for a prototype. And we'll uh, we'll have some internal conversations, and we'll be posting some things on the Desert Blockchain Meetup page as as an update. Can you put so, Jeff's contact info? Yeah, I got cards there, so I can read him, and you can put my contact info. Yeah. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap things up for tonight. I really, really appreciate everybody's time and attention here tonight. Um, your time and attention is valuable and your participation is greatly appreciated. Uh, next month on December 27th will be our next monthly uh, session. And I'm planning to do like a uh, summary of 2017 and maybe a, a let's look forward to 2018. Um, that's sort of the idea. If anybody has any other ideas that you'd like to propose, let them change. What's that? Gift exchange. A gift exchange? <laughs> that, uh, Rick, I have a sweater that would look so good on you. You are going to love this sweater. It's got a big reindeer right above the front. Based on how change. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
the reindeer's riding a blockchain. Oh, that's true. Yes. Did you say the 29th? 27. That's a Wednesday. December 27th, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So. So, and then maybe in January, I'm thinking about doing something like blockchain and cybersecurity, but yeah. Certainly open to suggestions and whatever. Um, hope you find this valuable. And uh, let's conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.